From Mountain Home to Raft River, we've got all the District 4 analysis you'll need to know. This is the Magic Valley PrepCast with Scott Burton. That's right. It's another edition of the Magic Valley PrepCast on IdahoSports.com, breaking down everything in District 4 in the state of Idaho each and every week. I'm Brandon Bainey, and as always, joined by the legendary Scott Burton. Scott, come on down. <laughs> Doing his best uh, Zoolander impression. <laughs> Again, uh, audio-only version of this podcast at IdahoSports.com and wherever you download your podcasts, you're going to have no idea what we're talking about. Video, if, you, if you watch the video version of this podcast on the IdahoSports.com YouTube channel or Facebook page, you will see that once again, Scott Burton has swaddled himself in all of his finest Los Angeles Rams gear as... Uh, your L.A. Rams uh, made the Super Bowl second year in a row that the uh, host stadium for the Super Bowl is going to feature the home team. Uh, that is correct, Brandon. And uh, hopefully for the second year in a row, the home team comes out ahead. I really feel like the last kid picked on the playground right now. So just a minute. <laughs> you look like uh, you look like. You look like the younger brother that's trying to be like cool like the older kids, and he puts on his big brother's football helmet and doesn't quite fit. <laughs> uh, okay, I think I'm ready now. Oh my holy, God. holy smokes. So, yeah, there's his uh, L.A. Rams shawl, and you had the helmet out earlier. And so, yeah, we are going to, we're just going to wear this like a cape because we are super that way. Mm, okay. I, I do think the Rams are set up pretty, pretty favorably uh, for that Super Bowl matchup. The Bengals offensive line has not been good and the Rams defensive line has been solid. So yeah, that's true. Oh, a little tight there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we have reached, you know, speaking of the, the playoffs and, and deep postseason runs, we have, we have reached the pinnacle for girls basketball district tournaments have started. Um, a lot of them started Monday, Tuesday this week. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I figured what I'll do is for uh, the people that are watching the video, I'm going to share my screen and we will put the brackets up on the screen. Now, if you're watching the video, you'll want to go full size on your screen so you can see the bracket clearly. Um, and, and we'll, we'll kind of just cover what's happened so far in districts and what's, what's still to come. We're recording this on Wednesday, February 2nd. So by the time you're listening to this, things may have changed. Games may have already been played. Your best bet is just to go to idahosports.com every night slash first thing in the morning because we will have updated district brackets, updated schedules, updated scores each and every night for all of that girls district action. It's right there on the homepage at idahosports.com. And uh, if you're listening audio only, uh, just follow along uh, by clicking on the brackets at uh, idahosports.com right on the homepage. So the Great Basin 7 Conference actually – Got it started this week, Scott. Um, yeah. With uh, the play-in game. So there's seven yeah. teams in the Great Basin Conference and six plays seven, basically. And that was Jerome, the sixth seed, against Wood River, the seven seed. And the Tigers won that game 53-24. to 24. They are now into the bracket. They have to play number three, Twin Falls, tonight at 7 o'clock at Twin Falls. And then in the other first round matchup, number four, Minico hosting number five, Canyon Ridge, number one, Burley, number two, Mountain Home got the first round buys. What do you, what do you make of this tournament field, Scott? Well, you know, I tell you what, th this tournament in, in my opinion, could go as chalk as any of the other tournaments. I mean, we've got Burley who's head and shoulders above everybody else. And it's going to be who is in that second place game. And, you know, Mountain Home is legit. You know, the thing that makes Mountain Home so good compared to everybody else is that they've got size. And that's what the teams in this particular conference don't handle very well. I mean, you, you look up and down, Twin Falls probably is where they should be, the third best seed. But I, they struggle with Mountain Home because they cannot handle their size. Twin is not a very big team. You know, they're a very well-disciplined, well-coached team. And you know, they've got a lot of shooters, but they just can't handle the paint. And uh, if somehow they find a way to paint by numbers, then they may have a shot, but they haven't been able to do it yet. So looking at this, you know, tournament, you know, Burley, I mean, of course, no injuries for anybody. Burley should cruise. 
And then it's going to be who is in second place. Now you look at the games that are going on tonight. Uh, Twin Falls, Jerome. I mean, Twin Falls is going to be the heavy favorite in that one. Um, of course, you never know. And then Minico and Canyon Ridge. That's really interesting because Canyon Ridge is one of those teams that they they play lights out one one night, and then the very next night you're like, where was that team the night before? So it's going to be really who shows up for for Canyon Ridge, and then for Minico, it helps there at home, you know, and with a lot of kind of running the point. Is she going to get any help? You know, so I think that game could be really, really interesting. But, you know, I see it working out pretty chalk in this thing. I think uh, Burley and Mount Home are the two that are going to go. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. And at, at this point, basically, it's just trying to maintain your positioning in the max preps rankings. You know, if state started today and, and Burley and Mountain Home both made it, Burley would be the two seed. Mountain Home would be the four seed. I think that speaks to the strength of both of those teams. So No, absolutely. So. You know, I was just having that conversation with our boys coach downstairs, uh, Joe Messick, on, man, I wonder what the rankings look like or what the max preps is going to look like one through eight when the boys tournament rolls around, assuming that that we get there. And we didn't talk too much about it because we've yet to play it. But uh, it's it's always an interesting thing, and this one's no different. Yep, for sure. So that uh, tournament off and running. The other tournament that got started on Monday night was uh, at the 1A D1 level. And we saw a couple of first round games Monday night. You had uh, number four, Lighthouse Christian, defeat number five, Shoshone, 41 to 26. And then you had uh, number three, Raft River, defeat number six, Glens Ferry, 73 to 17. I don't think either of those surprised anybody. So now you've got Murtaugh, the one seed. They had a first round bye. They'll play number four, Lighthouse, tonight. And then this is the big matchup here, Scott. I think this is what swings the entire bracket is. Number two, Oakley hosting number three, Raft River. Yeah, it's like uh, we've never heard Raft River and Oakley playing each other before. So that's that's kind of different sounding to me. Is it to you? Yeah, I n- <laughs> never. <laughs> and it's funny because uh, uh, Jerome, we are hosting the 1A D1 tournament here. So um, in just a little bit, I'm headed downstairs to get the team settled into their locker rooms. And uh, I'm going to be on the mic on the PA for it. We're going to make it, uh, we're going to make it big for these guys, but I've been looking forward to this because, you know, those first two games were, were pretty much, you know, not, not that close. Um, but we, we knew that might happen, but as we get into this second round, you know, I think, uh, I mean, Murtaugh heavy favorites, I think over lighthouse. Um, but man, that Oakley raft river game, that could be something. And uh, I'm excited to see that because, you know, Murtaugh is having a heck of a good year. Todd Jensen, uh, longtime basketball coach, uh, he's got his girls playing lights out. And, uh, you know, obviously you can never sleep on Oakley and Raft River ever in anything, whether it's basketball or swimming or tiddlywinks, it doesn't matter. They're going to make themselves relevant. So whoever comes out of that Raft River-Oakley game, they'll challenge Murtaugh. It'll be fun. The regular season games, Murtaugh, or excuse me, Raft River and Oakley, they split. And each mm-hmm. time the winning team won by two points, one basket. I mean, it doesn't get any closer than that. No, so that's why I've been really anxious to uh, get on the mic for this one and just have, you know, courtside seats and, and try not to get myself too wrapped up in it. But uh, it, I, I'm really looking forward to it. It should be a great game. And, you know, Murtaugh's going to stick around and, and, you know, if they get by Lighthouse, they're going to stick around and go, man, we got to deal with these guys. Uh, and that game, the winner of these two games, uh, that'll happen February 9th uh, at 730. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, February 9th, yeah, it's still going to be right here at Jerome. Yep. Uh, so here's my question, and maybe you know or don't, but whoever loses the semifinal game between Raft River and Oakley, they can still fight back through the consolation bracket, only two bids available to state, mm-hmm. but let's say, let's say Oakley loses to raft river and they come back through and they're playing raft river again for second and third place. Do they play that game since they already lost to them or do they just say, Nope, you already lost raft river gets that second spot. No. So it'd be a true, you know, double elimination. Okay. So let's, let's just say for the sake of argument, that it goes chalk, right? Okay. Murtaugh beats lighthouse. And let's say Oakley beats raft river. So that means Raft River, um, the loser of game four, they would go all the way back to play Shoshone. 
and then the winner of that one would would advance um, against looks like the winner of Lighthouse Glens Ferry. Now remember, this is all if it goes chalk, right? So let's say that Raft River wins that game. They go to the winner of game seven, which will be um, February 9th against the loser of Oakley and Murtaugh. And so then, I mean, it, it, everything's on a crash course. Like I said, if it goes chalk for these two teams to play each other twice in this tournament, the second go round is the one that goes to state. Yeah. Oh, that'd be so fun in my, in Montana where I grew up. If you, if you already lost to that team, sorry, you don't get to play them again. It's already been determined. It's kind of hardcore that way. Really? Boy, that yeah. is hardcore, man. Yeah. That, uh, that don't work. Don't work like that here in Idaho. So we, and, we, we let them play it out. So, I mean, when you look at it, it's like, you know, win, win your games, but if you lose this Raft River Oakley game tonight, there, there, there's such a, a separation I think between the top three teams in this conference and then everybody else that they, they really should have no problem working their way back around. And it's going to be that next game, the last game that you win, that's going to make the difference. So yeah, well, I'm looking for fun, fun tournament. I'm looking forward to an in-depth report on all of that happens tonight from you next week on the prep cast. <laughs> it's going to, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, other, uh, tournaments that got going last night, we had the, uh, sawtooth conference one, a D two, uh, first round, uh, you had number five, Camas County knock off number four, Hanson 33 to 29. I don't really think that's an upset. Camus just didn't get as many conference games as everybody else. And so that's why they got slotted below. Uh, number two, Carey defeats number seven, Hagerman 49 to seven. Number three, Richfield defeats number six, Castle Ford 52 to 26. So now in the semis, you've got number one, Dietrich against number five, Camus County, and number two, Carey against number three, Richfield. And Scott, any of these four, I think, are capable of, of winning the district tournament. I, I think this is the most wide open. Uh, it, it truly is. I mean, I think you've got the four, the final four teams in this one AD two bracket where they should be. Uh, you know, Dietrich, the favorite over Camus. You know, and like you said, Camus just uh, didn't have that many conference games. But it's been the year of the musher. You know, in, in sports this year, and so you, you know, don't count them out. But uh, Dietrich should be the favorite. It's that Kerry Richfield game that uh, I'm really interested in. I mean, it's it's like tobacco road with those guys. I mean, it's just a, a short stretch of road that separates the two schools, and uh, here here they go, and the winner will advance to play for the uh, district championship. I mean, when you look at the conference standings this year, Richfield, Dietrich, and Carey all went five and one. <laughs> they all they all beat it beat, beat each, other. each other. Yeah, so it was pretty interesting um, in terms of the semifinal matchups. Carey defeated Richfield earlier this year by four 31 to 27 so fairly close and in terms of Dietrich against Camas County Dietrich won that game by 20 46 26 so um we'll see last year they got two and a half bids to state this year they only get two so these again these are going to be high drama type games yeah and it's too bad because there's going to be a good team out of this conference that's going to stay home same with the D1s, right, between Raft River, Murtaugh, and Oakley. Somebody who probably should be at state uh, will not get to be. So, uh, Finally, let's take a look at uh, 2A, District 4. And actually, I need to pull up 3A as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so two, so 2A, we had the, uh, the opening round game uh, this week. Number two, Valley, against number three, Wendell. Valley won that game 43 to 36. They now get to play. Uh, the number one seed, Declo. Uh, Declo, I think, probably wins this district. There's only one bid to state from a three-team district, but you never know. Yeah, you, you don't, but, you know, you look at this district, this is the one that probably is the no-brainer, I think. You know, Declo should should cruise. I mean, it's a three-team conference, and all you got to do is be the best out of three, and, and declo has been that way all year. So I, there's no reason to think otherwise. Yeah, Declo will play Valley Thursday night at seven o'clock winner of that will move into the district championship game. And then also on Monday night, you had, uh, the three, a district Four, the S C I C conference. Uh, this went chalk as well. Number one filer defeated number four, Kimberly 51, 45 
Number two, Gooding defeated number three, Buell, 37-22. Uh, Kimberly hung with Filer. I was pretty impressed by the Bulldogs, actually. Um, they came up just a little bit short. Filer went undefeated in the conference this year and still looking strong. Yeah, you know, and here we are in that same boat again. I mean, you've got three teams that could actually, you know, do something here, but you can't take them all, you know. Uh, Filer has been at the top all season long, and I, I don't see them stumbling against Gooding. I don't. I think it could be a closer game, but Filer, I think, should be able to pull that one out. They've been, you know, tough all year long, you know, and you could tell me how they did in the regular season, but it, it I, I just see Filer and then Gooding and Kimberly battling it out for that second spot. Yeah, Filer – uh, Filer is a, a team that if you would let them get out and run, they, they've got so much speed. Um, yeah. I'm not sure there's many teams in 3A that are as fast as them. So if you let them get out and run, you're in trouble. If you can slow it down and put them in a half-court game, you've got a shot. Um, so this year against Gooding, they won the first matchup by two, 60-58. to 58. That was back on December 15th. And uh -huh. then in the rematch, uh, January 26th, so not too long ago, they won 56 to 42. So that's a 14 point victory. So, yeah, you know, and that's the thing that you look at too is, is, is what was their most recent game? Because that's probably more indicative of how the teams have developed a little bit. Early season games are really tough to tell because you're still trying to figure out who you are. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm saying Filer is probably, well, bold prediction here. Filer is the favorite in this, uh, in this, in this tournament, but it's going to be that gooding. Um, you know, I, I think I think Kimberly's going to get by Buell. I mean, I, I just think they will, and I think Kimberly and Gooding are going to battle it out for that second spot. Yep, and the, whoever takes second will advance to a play-in game against either the second place team from District Five or the second place team from District Six. They have to play a second play-in game. Second place from five plays second place from six, and then the winner of that has to play second place from four, so it's just a convoluted mess in, in 3A yeah. basketball <laughs> for sure. Okay, yep. so so that is uh, that is what's going on in girls district basketball. In terms of boys basketball, the big story came actually from Jerome High School last week. Scott, as I, I felt like, you know, back in the day, uh, scoring a thousand points was like a big deal. Um, but we've seen so many players eclipse that barrier this year. Is it becoming more common or is it just a really good group of athletes this year? I, you know, it's interesting because you, you, you see a lot of the thousand point scores and, and a variety of them. I mean, are they, are they all that they've got? And so this team has to rely on this person to score all their points, you know, or, are they surrounded by so many good players that you can't just focus on one guy and then he still becomes the score, you know? So it's, it's kind of an interesting path on, on how they get there. We do see, I think more times than not a thousand point score being the only offensive weapon on that team. And so they have to score 20 a night, you know, in this particular case, when we're talking about Mikey Lloyd from Jerome, that is not the case which makes the feat, I think, even more um, astounding is because he's got four other players on the floor um, that can score. He doesn't have to score. So he is scoring and sharing the ball at the same time. So that makes your efficiency level that much better because you are sharing your shots with everybody else. You know, And, and so when Jerome can put five guys on the, on the court this year alone that can score, it, it, it's really fascinating that Mikey has been able to do this. I mean, as a junior, he averaged just over 17 points a game. And as a senior, he's almost at 18 points a game. So, I mean, he's not dropped off even when the talent around him has gotten better. And so you can't double Mikey all the time. And I think that is helping him quite a bit. And Jerome is so well coached that they just move the basketball. They find the open guy. They, they've got their sets. Um, and yet Mikey still – figures out how to put the ball in the basket. You're going to be okay there, but <laughs> I have to keep coughing. And so I don't want to do yeah, that no, over I the air. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah so, but he, but he's doing it in a, in a number of different ways too. I mean, he can obviously shoot the three ball, but he's 
six five, and so he gets inside too, and he's around the rim. He's cleaning up garbage, but he's got a really good rapport with his teammates too, and it's like they know where he's at. And uh, a couple of times this year, Scotty Cook, our point guard, would lead the break down the floor, look over his shoulder, and Mikey's trailing him off the backboard. Here comes Mikey and throws it down. You know, so you you see those 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 types of chemistry moments develop and. Man, Mikey is just a really good player, and he's a great kid, too. It's really been fun to watch the trajectory of his career coinciding with Jerome's return to prominence because uh, I I remember it three years ago. uh, Mikey was a sophomore. Scotty Cook was a freshman, and Jerome was the worst team in the conference. And it was back Mm -hmm. when it was that huge 10-team conference. They They were not very good. And Mikey Lloyd was kind of a scrawnier kid and kind of relied more on just his size. He would post kids up and, and, and shoot a lot of threes. And then in the offseason, he really dedicated to working on his ball handling. And, okay, I can catch it on the perimeter and not just hoist a three. I can take it to the rim. I can be a facilitator. And that, I think, in turn inspired all the other guys to, to elevate their games as well. And so to see now, you know, you add a Skylar Mauer to the mix and Gavin Capps put on more muscle um, so yes. to watch this Jerome program flourish, because I, I, I remember still vividly when they were not very good and it's a lot of the same players and they basically took it upon themselves to, Hey, if we want to be competitive, we got to put the work in and they have, and now they're the best team in the conference. Yeah. And, you know, going back to last year, I mean, they are their last 43 games, they're 39 and four. You know, and so this is a team that is just rolling right now. 17 and one this year, 16 game winning streak. You know, but the the other thing about Mikey, too, is, you know, he's pulling uh, a lot of rebounds. I mean, he's almost averaging seven rebounds a game, you know. So, I mean, he's doing it all. A couple of assists, a couple of steals a game, you know, the 18 points. I mean, this kid is all over the place and he's been a gym rat since he's been this big. You know, and I, I coached him uh, when he was a freshman, and and you could just tell that this kid was going to be special. You know, if he just continued to stay in the gym, he continued to grow, and and he did. And then you've got the complement of players around him too, like you just mentioned with Caps and Cook and Maurer and Elison. That starting five is legit, and it's so much fun to be part of that. Uh, here at Jerome, but you know, hats off to Mikey. We had a nice uh, little ceremony for him after the game. Uh, we didn't want to stop the game or do anything like that, so we had a ball ready underneath. And uh, as soon as it was over, and the, the team shook hands, we stopped everybody before they left and uh, awarded Mikey the game ball. The band stayed and played, and then Mikey took the game ball with his teammates behind him and dunked it. And and everybody just went nuts, and uh, it was it was just a cool cool moment, and that's something this kid's gonna remember. Yeah, he's he's a he's a true point forward, right? He can bring the ball up, he can lead the break, um, but he can also bang inside if you need him to. So, yeah, that's uh, that was that was nice. And the third uh, member of the one thousand point career club this year from the Magic Valley, Brandon Bethel from Mountain Home, and yep. uh, Ashley Boats from Camas County. So, yeah, that's pretty cool company. Pretty incredible stuff for sure. So uh, from uh, long careers to things that are just starting out, girls wrestling and an officially exactly. sanctioned sport for the, for the first time this year. And so because of that, we're having a lot of these first year events and Burley hosted a, a female only wrestling event this past weekend, their first ever. Yeah. And I talked to a couple of people that uh, were involved with this tournament and they all just were raving about it. You know, it was, uh, ended up with 92 girls from 23 teams in Idaho and Nevada. Um, I mean, that, I mean, think about that. That's just a lot of female wrestlers descending on Burley, 92 of them, uh, to, to wrestle. And it, it's, it's pretty cool because it's got that kind of momentum now. I mean, you know, some schools in this valley have, have got a contingent of female wrestlers and others don't. Um, but, uh, you know, Canyon Ridge is one of those and they took second Emmett took first Canyon Ridge took second. Um, and, uh, I mean, it was some really good wrestling going on, you know, and, and we, we've seen it here. I mean, I've been at, a, you know, a lot of the wrestling matches here at Jerome and, you know, we don't have that girls program just yet. So the girls from the other teams have got to wrestle dudes 
and and there are some tough, good wrestlers out there, you know. So I'm kind of I'm excited to see how this sport grows, especially with the girls and and with the state tournament this year. That that should be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, it's it's really fun to watch uh, because, like you said, some athletes are more accustomed to it and have kind of dove into the deep end of the pool right off the bat because they've been wrestling. Uh, non-sanctioned the past several years some are hey it's a new experience and we're trying it out and learning as we go and so to see that dichotomy too has been really fun on the mats this year um boys yeah, wrestling uh, boys. a lot of seating going on here too because they looked at yeah. this tournament right here as a huge indicator of how the girls wrestling tournament's going to get seated this year because here they all were in the same place you know how are they going to do it and they had some really good performances i mean uh, Zoe Freeze out of CUNA um, beat uh, the girl from Bonneville. Uh, Ivy Flo of Twin Falls was was up there as well. Um, McKeeley Townsend of Marsh Valley took fourth at 145. And all of those guys are looking to be district champs in their respective conferences. And so people are going to be looking back at this tournament when it comes time to seed. And, uh, and and really putting some stake into this, and you know, Big Mountain Auction stepped up big time to sponsor this tournament, and uh, and and really provided a lot of what this this needed, and they are excited to grow it next year to make it even bigger. Yeah, it's uh, so fun to see uh, this sport blossom before our eyes. Uh, boys wrestling had a huge meet this last weekend as well, the Red Halverson meet, hosted by Minico, and th this to me was a really good preview of how the four A state wrestling tournament's going to go because you had all the big players there, right? You had, you had Minico, Jerome, Nampa. Uh, I believe Blackfoot was there. Blackfoot yep. always carries good numbers into state. And yep. Nampa, Nampa won the team title for the first time in over 30 years, Scott. So that wow. was pretty, pretty exciting for the Bulldogs. Oh, absolutely. But not surprising. They took the uh, state runner up last year in the four A's. And uh, they were bringing back some pretty good pieces of that team. And so you knew that Nampa was going to be in the conversation uh, at the state tournament and every other tournament they went to. So it's not surprising that the Red Halverson was something that they succeeded at. But a lot of these teams are looking at this particular tournament as kind of the precursor to state, you know, because state is just around the corner. How are you going to function in this type of environment with some of the best wrestlers here? So this is a time for you to kind of, you know, put your foot down, create a little swagger, put some doubt into your opponent's mind and show that you can handle a stage that's going to be, you know, not not venue wise, but wrestler wise as the state tournament. And so, you know, a lot of these teams come in here to the Red Halverson taking it very seriously, especially when they've got teams at full strength. Now, that's kind of the other part of the puzzle right now is it's it, it just seems like it in wrestling more so than anything else that a lot of these teams go to these tournaments not at full strength. And so you, you may not get really what this team is indicative of doing because you're going to have kids that are out with COVID. You're going to have kids uh, that are out with grades <laughs> because they had a really bad week or whatever the case is. So more and more, I mean, we've hosted all these tournaments and I've been to all these tournaments and I talked to all these coaches yeah, we're missing four of our top wrestlers. Yeah, we're missing our top guy. We're missing. So you get that quite a bit. Um, just don't let it happen at district and state. Yeah, and sometimes it's kind of like track and field where if you've got a really elite wrestler on your team, he might opt to go to a big you know, regional meet in mm -hmm. Washington or Utah or something like that to, to compete against real big time opponents or sometimes you know your three or four best guys will go to oregon and compete mm -hmm. in a in a prestigious tournament there so you're right uh not every team always has their full squad minico took second in the team standings and where yep. did your legrand oregon took third where did jerome finish uh, jerome fifth? finished sixth sixth okay which was a little bit i mean a little bit it was quite a bit below par for them um but, uh, you know, they did have six wrestlers in the top six. But, you know, the big players were in the top six, you know, especially in the foray. Nampa, Minico, Blackfoot, Jerome. I mean, those are the ones that are going to be fighting at the state tournament. Uh, the, the interesting thing is going to be what happens at the district tournament here in the Great Basin because you've got Minico and Jerome. 
in the same conference fighting for X amount of spots and, and whatever. Uh, but it, this shook out kind of like we thought it would, you know, uh, CUNA obviously wrestling powerhouse for years. They were in the mix as well. So there's some good wrestling coming up. And I just hope that all the teams are going to be at full strength. So we really get who the best team is going to be. Yeah, in terms of that 4A state competition, of those four teams you just rattled off, I bet Blackfoot gets the most kids through only because their district, it's really them and a pretty sizable gap between everybody else. Jerome and Minico, like you said, will cancel each other out a little bit, although Minico did bring the most wrestlers at the 4A ranks last year. Um, and and then Napa is going to, you know, because Bishop Kelly is solid, Caldwell, Columbia, they all have talented individuals that will – knock some of uh napa's wrestlers out as well so um it's it's gonna be fun well it is and there's so much that goes into winning a state title in wrestling and it's not about all the time bringing the most weapons it's about how you win those matches you know because you could have most of your guys win two to one but they're not scoring points for your team you know you get the pins the tech falls uh you know the major decisions those kinds of things are bringing points and so you know, you you see uh, some of these guys trying to wrestle the perfect match to where they, they score in points, but they won't pin their guy. They get that tech fall, you know, or they're right on the tech fall, a point away from it. And then all of a sudden they just roll a guy and pin it. Perfect match because they've got all their bases covered. And that's, that's how Jerome won it last year. Um, the coaching staff was so smart. Um, Ted Larson, TJ Ringling this year leading the play, leading the, the crew, Josh Wright last year, they understand that. And good wrestling coaches, like the ones from the programs we just mentioned, they know it's not just to going out and winning two to one. You've got to score points. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun to see how that all shakes out in a couple of weeks. But for now, some pretty good regular season competition to whet our appetite. So, all right, Scott, we'll let you run. I know you've got to start warming up for your uh, for your DJ gig. <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to be uh, – on the mic, spinning records, playing music, uh, doing the PA, just kind of trying to create an exciting atmosphere for these 1A teams that are coming into our joint tonight. Uh, it should be it should be fun. Hopefully they enjoy it. Hopefully I don't screw it up too bad. Yeah, you'll be you'll do just fine. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we're uh, we're gonna have some state bids to hand out on next week's edition of the Magic Valley Prepcast and and more big boys basketball matchups to talk about as well. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. For Scott Burton, I'm Brandon Bainey. We'll see you next time on the Magic Valley Prepcast on IdahoSports.com.